And I think it's having the courage just to follow a few different things. What we have this this societal expectation of is that you leave high school and you choose a job for the rest of your life, that you go to university, you get the training. And how many people stay in the training because they went to university and they're like, otherwise I've wasted my university degree. It's, it's crazy, really. But what we what it is, it's really about starting to look at what lights you up. What do you have fun doing? The first thing that goes when we're stressed is all of the stuff that lights us up. So if you've been stressed for a long time, I mean, I remember after, well, as I was going through that whole divorce process, both the separation and divorce, I had no clue what I enjoyed anymore. I didn't know. I had to think back, okay, what were some of the things that I used to enjoy? Well, I used to enjoy dancing. I used to enjoy this. I used to enjoy that. Okay. So there's some starting points. And that's kind of where I had to start with it. It's playing with it. It's giving yourself permission to try a lot. Namaste, beautiful souls. I'm Shilpa, and you're tuned into the Omni Mindfulness Podcast, a sanctuary for spiritual entrepreneurs. As a holistic mindfulness coach and social marketing strategist, I'm here to guide you on a transformative journey. On this show, we explore captivating stories and provide practical tools that deepen your connection with your authentic self. Through the personal and professional narratives of remarkable individuals, we expand our consciousness and ignite the spark of possibility. Each season, I curate content that empowers you to create a holistic lifestyle encompassing spirituality, mindfulness, energy awareness, and mindset. Join me as we engage in conversations with experts in their respective fields and share solo casts from yours truly, all aimed at supporting you and relaxing, revitalizing, resetting your body, mind, and spirit. I'm your host and the visionary behind Omni Mindfulness. So what if just one story had the power to shift the trajectory of your life? What if you could become an instrument in helping others realize their true selves? And what if your soul's higher purpose lies in experiencing the joy of Omni Mindfulness? Remember, it's never too late to rewrite your story. Welcome to Season 7 as we embark on an an exhilarating journey into energy awareness. In July, we explore the driving forces that fuel the lives of my guests, uncovering their passion and purpose. In August... We delve into the profound connection between somatic movement and vitality. And finally, in September, we explore holistic awareness, where mind, body, and spirit unite for transformative experiences. Stay tuned for insightful conversations, expert guests, and tools to cultivate conscious energy awareness. So let's dive into the season of energy awareness together. Greetings, sweet listeners. Today, we have an extraordinary guest joining us. She wears many hats, including being an author, kinesiologist, mentor, archetypal life coach, and a loving mother. Allow me to introduce you to Amanda Kate, the talented individual behind Divine Messy Human, a spiritual guide to prioritizing internal truth over external influences. Amanda's journey has been one of self-discovery and growth. As a recovering people pleaser and self-flagellator, she embraces the delicate balance between the divine and the messy aspects of life. Continuously evolving and seeking new ways of being, she strives to make a positive impact on the world, leaving it a better place than she found it. Residing in the vibrant city of Melbourne, Australia, Amanda shares her life, her twin flame, her children, his children, and an adorable dog named Zeus. Her experiences and insights are a testament to the transformative power of embracing our messy humanity while prioritizing our internal truth. Without further ado, let's warmly welcome Amanda Kate as we embark on a journey of self-discovery, passion, and purpose. Well, Amanda, thank you for being here. 
Oh, thank you so much for having me. I've been looking forward to this chat. Yes, it's been a long time in the works, so I'm, I'm glad we are together today. So to get started, um, our topic today is passion and purpose from the perspective of mindfulness and mindset. And I know you have a wealth of knowledge, not only in terms of skills and experience, but also your story has been tugging at my heart since I read up on it months ago when we first connected. So perhaps you can start with a little bit of your backstory. Yeah, so um, I did all of the tick box things. I, you know, was a well-behaved child in a, you know, a Church of England home. We had high expectations for our behaviour, for the way that we interacted with the world, for all of that. And I knew that, you know, I didn't need to veer too far outside of the lines or even, you know, I got sometimes only close to the line before I'd be pulled back into line and be made to behave in a certain way. And so the expectations were always there and there was always this shaving off of parts of me to fit in and to feel loved. And I was a massive people pleaser. I thought that the only way I could gain love was to make everybody else happy because every time I did something that was really true to me, I would be shamed or laughed at or being told I was too sensitive or there'd be something negative come. So I, I started to cut off all of those parts that were me and just realized that towing the line was the way to go. And so I ticked all the boxes, good grades, high school, uni, went and worked for my dad for a bit. And then I went traveling with my sister and I went off the rails for a couple of years, really um, partying and things like that. I think it was that time of freedom for me to start exploring who I was but even in that I was trying to make everybody else happy and to try and be the person that everybody else was being rather than actually looking at who was I and what did I want from life and there was a lot of numbing that went on in that time and then I met my soon-to-be well not at the time but soon-to-be husband and then ex-husband and there was this I guess these immediate sparks, I had had a serious relationship in Australia that broke up and I thought he was the one and all of that stuff that you think when you're very, very young. And so I kind of fell into this relationship of, you know, he's the kind of person that you should be with, that you should get married to, that you, you know, and this is much easier to see in hindsight, even though I remember even at the time going, he's really not my type, but perhaps this is a good thing because my type so far has not ended so well. <laughs> and so I went into that thought process. Anyway, because I was in the UK, it was, we got engaged after seven months and married after 14 months together. And it was that whirlwind. It was both amazing and bad all together there were some really incredible times but there were also some really huge rows like massive screaming fights that i'd never had with anyone before but he would play these cat and mouse games with me and i just wanted to be seen and heard and so this was even before we got married and then i still went through with it um in hindsight i had all of the red flags um and then I remember getting back to the UK and one of our first nights back there, he said, well, you're on your own now. You kind of got to sort your own life out because I've got my friends and my life. You've got to work out what you're doing. And I'm going, hang on, I've just married you. And now I'm in a country over the other side of the world. And you're telling me that you've got your life. I thought we were creating a life. And there were a lot of little messages like that that kept coming through. And he did, he put himself first. And anytime I wanted to do something for myself, I would get chastised or he would make sure that he would come along. And looking back, I see all of the signs of what I was in, but because I was so isolated from friends, from family, from support networks, from, you know, people who loved me, I didn't have literally anyone else. 
And I didn't really have the financial capability to make it back home because I wasn't able to work through our engagement because my visa had expired um, in terms of I was still allowed to be there, but I was on a holiday visa, not a working visa. And until we got married, I couldn't get the spousal visa. And so there was all of these issues that increased the control. And I ended up just submitting to it. So we had two children, you know, again, still ticking the boxes. I'm married to a rich, successful man. We're having our children. We've got a beautiful home. We're doing international travel, you know, and I was miserable. I was miserable. I was getting sick. I was struggling with life because even though I was married and had a husband, I was a single mother from Monday to Friday. I was the only person who did anything. And then on the weekends, he would make himself scarce. He would play football for literally half a day on the Saturday. And then he would take us up to his family's house and he'd just go in and play on his parents' computer while I amused his parents. And and his mother was not a very nice person to me. Um, and so there was all of this stuff going on that I accepted that it was my life. And also there was still this part of me going, this doesn't feel normal. This doesn't feel right. And watching other people's relationships and hearing them speak on the phone to their partner and all of these different things, I, I, I guess it started raising more and more questions. And in 2011, we had the opportunity to move back to Australia because his role was made redundant. And I really pushed the issue. And I think part of it was knowing that I could have never left him in the UK because I still would have been on my own. At least in Australia, I was on home soil. But when we were moving back to Australia, he kept that separation going by saying, we're never living near your family. If we can't be near mine, we've got to move somewhere else. And so we moved um, about 10 hours away from where my family were. And again, I accepted, I understood, and I was like, well, at least I can drive home in a day. So there were all of these things that were, were building up. And in the end, my health gave out. I ended up with chronic fatigue. I ended up with the start of Hashimoto's disease. I would have one bad night on a weekend, you know, having drinks with friends and eating, you know, cheese and the things that I really shouldn't eat. I'd put on two kilos, three kilos even from one night. Then I would take all week to lose that weight. I wouldn't quite lose it all. I'd have one blowout. And I was eating so carefully through the rest of the week to try and shift that weight. And eventually it would just keep piling on and on and on. And I was feeling sluggish and horrible. In the end, it took four professionals telling me I had chronic fatigue before my ex-husband believed me because he had that story. It's always worse for everyone, for you. Everyone else gets tired, but you're exhausted. And all of these sorts of comments about how I was not coping, but I was actually really unwell and I was still having to fight through the day because he would not lift a finger to help. He was just, oh, you're just always such a drama queen. I'm like, I am really unwell here. And this kept on for a while. Western doctors were sort of saying, well, your blood works fine. We don't really know what to do with you because you're the healthiest sick person we've seen. We don't really know. They didn't even mention chronic fatigue. It was my chiropractor, my Chinese doctor, my kinesiologist, and I believe even my psychologist who said, I think you've got chronic fatigue. And there was probably one, and my naturopath told me as well. So I had all these professionals going, you've got chronic fatigue. And I'm going, okay, now it's starting to make sense. But in that journey, the way I found kinesiology was I, we got back from a family holiday whereby I had been screamed at for four hours about all of my shortcomings, everything that made me a terrible human being. And I got back going, there is no point me living. And I went to my doctor and got a mental health care plan and went to a psychologist that I knew worked in a mindfulness way because I really, I don't know, I'd started exploring that the last few years. I'd found some books I'd found, And I went, it really sounds like something that I need. And so, but the receptionist there was the one who really found me the kind of natural therapies that I've found have really helped my health the most. She said to me, you know, you sound like you're under a lot of stress. Who's got your back? 
And I just crumbled. I'm like, you're the first person who's asked me about my relationships. And I said to her, no one. I said, I fall over this whole house of cards comes crumbling down. And I said, and I'm fallen. <laughs> you know? And she ended up saying, well, look, it's a month before we can get you in to um, see the psychologist at six weeks before the mindfulness course. Have you thought about kinesiology? And I just, I was desperate. I said, yep, fine, whatever. I don't know what it is. Don't really care. If you think it might help, I'm going. And that first session changed my life. She said to me, you have no idea how emotionally abused you are, do you? And that made a lot of sense with a lot of the relationships in my life. It took me four months to see that my biggest emotional abuser was my ex-husband. And it took me eight months from that session to leave him. But within six months of that, I was sitting in the classroom learning how to be a kinesiologist because even before I'd left him, it had changed me so much. And I'd started finding parts of myself that I'd forgotten even existed, but on so many deep levels I knew were there. And it was just so transformative. And I knew that I ne I needed to help people in that way. So, yeah. Wow, that's so fascinating when you were describing the journey that was just about when you said um, the lines and going outside of the lines and recognizing that. But yeah. a lot of, um, I would say, behavior of women that I've known of, even my mom included, mm. had a history of staying within the lines yeah. and that affects them on a level that is subtle and yeah. unspoken of. Like they may not be aware of it. <laughs> No, and I wasn't aware of how much of a people pleaser I was until I started unpacking a lot of the trauma that I'd been holding. Because although my parents are very, very loving, there was a lot of guilt, shame and blame to keep us in line, which which goes with the whole church narrative, really. And I'm not, you know, I'm not, dis I, I truly believe in God and Jesus and and a lot of the stories, but there's this human aspect which believes that we rule through fear. And, and that was very much, you know, my mum would say, if you do this, I'll break both your legs. And I know she was only joking, but still as a really sensitive child, I was terrified. <laughs> and I know she was only joking. And as a conscious adult, I can see, you know, where she was coming from in making jokes like that. But it really did stop me from veering outside of those lines. And and the consequences, I always felt like if I did veer outside the lines that I wasn't loved. And, and I really believe that this is where women put themselves on such a positive spin of I'm a people pleaser, this is an amazing thing, because we are trained to be selfless as women. We're trained to be selfless, but selfless does what it says on the tin. It makes less and less and less and less of ourselves. And what we are doing is giving everything that we have to everybody else around us and not taking any consideration about ourselves. And you look at things like thyroid disease, which is one of the largest diseases that is medicated for for women. What is the thyroid? It is our voice. Our voice gets taken. We aren't clear to express. And when we do express, we're thinking so much about making sure that everybody else is happy, that our voice is not coming out as our true authentic voice. And I agree with the fact that some of these physiological conditions that mm. manifest in our body are really on a more holistic spiritual level mm. signal of bigger things. So I have yeah. a thyroid condition. I had mm. a friend who was really spiritual and understanding of the human body yeah. and when I was fairly young I, I got diagnosed and I was telling her about it and mm. she's like, oh well that might mean that you have a difficult time expressing your self mm. yeah yeah and so that that was a signal I mean because the, in the western society it, now things have shifted I would say mm. not 30 years but years ago it was just here's a physical body and that is who you are then there's a the mental and then there's the other stuff which yeah. was not spoken of yeah. And I think, I mean, even now there is very clear separation. And I think if you haven't found natural therapies, 
a lot of people do think they're woo woo, they're out there, they're non scientific. They have a lot of these perceptions about them. What I am loving is in the last few years, science is starting to actually look into some of this stuff because there is private funding for it. Because let's face it, most of the medical industry is funded by the pharmaceutical industry and they you know, they have their agenda and, and other people have theirs and, and everything is agenda led, let's face it, because it's about profits. And, and, and I've noticed that when I go and explore different modalities, I have some who are supporting me to be healthy and vital and well, and others who are supporting me to just not be sick. And I think that's where sometimes the line blurs. And I think I've found some incredible GPs who are really looking at that mind, body, spirit, but all of my physical conditions were coming through the psychological and emotional abuse that I had suffered for years. Yes. Mm. yes. It's good that that revelation, even though it came through pain yeah. and a beautiful journey, but that revelation came to you as opposed to some people mm. live out their entire lives. And yeah. you've taken that, I would say, experience and turn it into a healing tool for others. Yeah, yeah. I think the other thing um, that I have found really, really interesting, even within the natural therapies, is often still, say, one might focus on the body or one might focus on the emotions or one might focus on the mind. You know, the mind is obviously a psychology type um, modalities. You've got your physical modalities. So I guess more modern day yoga, not the true yoga mind body spirit connection but the insta yoga <laughs> the pt the gym the there are a lot of physical therapies that look at the physical body there are a lot of things that just look at your emotional health i think the important thing and this is why i've used so many modalities not just the ones i've studied in my healing is because it's really important to have the mind the emotions the spirit and the body all being healed and all being looked at together because we have a lot of spiritual health issues in our society we have a lot of mental health emotional health and bodily health stuff and if we think that one is separate from the other i think we're missing a lot of the picture and the reason i have used so many different modalities including western medicine is because i don't believe there is one fix in any one modality. I don't believe I'm ever going to be fully healed and fully self-realized using one modality. And so I'm a really big believer in mixing them up. Absolutely. My approach personally for myself is mm. a kind of a holistic daily lifetime routine. And I know that if something slips and it often does, you know, then um, it takes a while to get back in the groove. But if I'm strictly focused on, say, I must um, ride the bike every day for 20 minutes, but then I let everything else drop, it, it, it will affect me. Yeah. If I do everything as a balance, like get in the meditation, do a tiny bit of journaling or at least self-reflection. Yeah. And yeah, if you need, if your back is hurting, you can take that Advil if you need to. Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. And I think this is it. It's about having a, a really a dynamically a balanced approach because the I sort of get a bit mm, with that word balance because people expect that that balance means almost stability. But the only time we're truly balanced is when we're sitting or standing. If you think about our movement, we're always you know, refinding our center of gravity. And I think that's the idea of balance that we want to be thinking about is 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 moving things about because let's face it if we don't sleep well or if our energy is lower in that day or if our if our mental health isn't as good one day then yeah we might need to put a little bit more effort into that but as you say it's not letting the other things slip because they're all tied together and it's having for me it's very much about having simple practices that I can put throughout my day that keep me centered and grounded in that dynamically balanced way, because things are never going to be an exact balance sheet with both columns lining up. It's just not. 
look at the way we date with our list of qualities that we want people to have and it's like this tick list and everything seems to want to go into these balance sheets where everything lines up and I just think life doesn't quite work that way so again I like the idea of you know you've got a bit of journaling you've got your cycling you know we've got our Advil or whatever it is if we need it um and I think that's a really that's the healthy approach that I I really um speak a lot to my clients about and I like that you adjusted the language there from balance to more dynamic balance Mm. because it is that movement our bodies are our movement, but Mm. if you think of it more holistically or spiritually, our Mm. entire beings, all of our beings, you know, outside of the physical one, they're in constant movement Mm. and responding to say the moon cycle or somebody else's temperament and learning to stay grounded when something else happens. All of this is movement of energy. Yes, absolutely. Absolutely. I, I've, but even, you know, within us, our lungs are always moving, our diaphragm's always moving, our heart's always moving, our liver's always working. There are parts of us that are constantly in movement and motion as well. And, you know, even when we look at that quantum physics side of things, even our things that look solid, when you go down to a cellular level, there is still space within them. So we're thinking we're with solid things, but there's actually space in the middle of those cells. It's just that we can't see that vibration. Yes, yes. And I, the fact that we are now talking about these <laughs> concepts on a more, it's, it, it sounds esoteric, yeah. right? You know, concepts of vibration and energy and movement. However, when we put it, put life in that perspective, it gives us the ability to know that we are in control of things or yeah. have the ability not may not have complete control but we have the ability to embrace that energy and i i love the fact that you've now taken your knowledge of what felt painful mm. you know it, it was starting to manifest in your body you felt yeah. it emotionally for years and you felt in your body and then you sought out knowledge and education mm. to yeah. then say okay I know what this is. I can recognize the signs. And you've even written a book about it, The Divine Messy, right? Yeah, Divine Messy Human. (laughs) And it's a spiritual guide to prioritizing internal truth over external influence. And again, that speaks to us walking within the lines. And it's not just women who do it. You think about the the stories that men have to go through as well we are all being damaged by this societal influence that we've been living under for let's face it the last two to four thousand years it has been about fear and control it has been about power over it has been about comparison and all of that stuff damages all of us there's probably a what 0.5 percent of the population not even that benefits from this society that has been built And everybody else at the moment that I see is suffering, whether it be white men or people of color or women or any minority group, all of us are suffering through the constructs within society. And a lot of it is because we have lost our connection to our spiritual self. We have lost our connection to one another because power over doesn't allow for connection power over says there is one ladder and for me to get to the next run i need rung i need to rip you off the ladder and push you down a rung and i need to climb over you and that's the way our society has been run so far it is (laughs) that flawed idea where i love the science is now being a bit more flawed with the darwin theory of survival of the fittest it's not actually always survival of the fittest it could be the smartest or the prettiest or the you know (laughs) whatever but we have that idea that for me to win you must lose and that damages everybody what i try and work with is that the rising tide raises all the ships it's about all of us collectively waking up to our unique expression of collective conscience our as as we were speaking about before our passion and purpose in this world waking up to what we are here to do and being able to bring that into the world because i i say this to my clients every single time that you are being nasty to yourself through self-talk through unloving behaviors through 
all of those different things, you are effectively telling the creator of the universe that they made a mistake when they put you here. And personally, I don't think that I'm (laughs) wise enough to be able to tell them that they made a mistake. (laughs) Absolutely. Whether it's you call it divine, God, the universe, or your higher force, but your higher force often is nudging and reminding you yeah. to your inner self your soul perhaps that you are more than this yes yeah 100 percent. and i ignored those soul callings for so long and i think that's why i am so passionate about the work that i've done because i've lived the changes and to go back seven to ten years to how much i hated myself to how much I did not want to be in this world because I felt like I just didn't belong and there was no purpose for me here. To now understanding that I do have a big purpose and I'm living it. And there is those things that light us up are our soul going, yes, more of that. You think of when we're children before we get those messages that we're not good enough, that we're too sensitive, that we're, you know, <laughs> if we do this, then we're not lovable. However, if we behave in this perfect way, then we are. If we go before that conditioning, think about it. I was working with a client last night or yesterday on chanting and singing, and they were so self conscious to even do it with me, just me. I'm going, this is part of freeing your voice. This is what I'm, you know, this is part of your homework to be doing practice. And there was a real hesitation, really struggled. They would only actually do it if I chanted so that they couldn't, I couldn't hear them. Yet think back to when we're children. If we're two, three, four, five, six, sometimes if we're really lucky, we get to push it a bit further. We sing and dance all the time. We couldn't care less what people think of us until we're shamed often enough for it that we all of a sudden do care what people think about us. (laughs) Absolutely. Well, in this passion that you're bringing forth, um, it's speaking to also addressing and coming up with a framework for, I would say the next generation, maybe the next generation Mm -hmm. of women and as well as men, (laughs) that we are not here to judge or shame Mm. and that we're all energetic human oh no we're energetic beings not human beings this is limiting but we're energetic beings and that there's a bigger purpose here because Mm. you've gone through that journey i i know that you had been in uh more of like a corporate um culture before i've been through it and i recall um very painful scenarios let's just say Mm -hmm. like damaging scenarios to my heart where I would be feeling like I need to dial it down. I need, I can't be me. Yeah. And to the yeah. point where then you feel like, do I need to not be around at all? Because I don't feel like, uh, mm. and, and then on, in addition to it, there are other souls in certain environments who are damaged themselves. So mm. they, ref, they project that energy on you. Yeah. And it's fascinating when you say that I used to joke at one of the companies I worked with that when we tapped our card to get into the building, our security card, that it sucked our personality out. And then we got it back when we left. (laughs) I think there's a a TV show about that as well. Yeah, I'll tell you about that later. But there's a good TV show about that. Um, Severance, that's the one. Oh, okay. I haven't seen that. But uh, yeah, Yeah. that's how I used to feel. I used to feel that I would tap my card, it would suck my soul out. I'd go up to my desk, do my thing. We'd go out to the pub at lunchtime or to a restaurant lunchtime or something. And everybody would come alive and be themselves. And then we'd go back in the building and I'd be like, this is really bizarre. It is bizarre. And you do get a level of I would say soul sucking. <laughs> yeah. That occurs and it takes a while to heal. And I'm not saying that working in that environment can't be healthy, but I believe it's a time now where people like yourself can bring that knowledge and saying you can be 
whole and and you in those cultures just the way i think you learned that that first marriage you could be whole in you without losing your identity yeah i i couldn't have done that within my marriage and that's why i had to leave and it's really interesting you know people have often said to me you were so brave for leaving but i did not have another choice i literally did not have another choice i had to leave and it was it was not an environment that I could be myself because the more myself I became, the more abuse I copped and it, and the sicker I got. And so that was part of that decision or not decision, but that forcing for me, I think it's really interesting. I believe some people are born to, I don't know, be accountants or be lawyers or be whatever it is. We need all of these different professions what I think is challenging are all of those people who are doing it because it's a good career choice or because that's what they're expected to do by their parents or we are missing out on so many artists and creatives because people are killing that side of themselves to fit into the mold. And you know what, sometimes we need to get a job to make ends meet. Let's face it, sometimes the job is just the means to the end. It's the fact that often we end up killing off our creative side. Now, there are some very creative accountants out there, you know, who see numbers and they just work for them and they love them. Now, and I've met a couple of them and I'm like, you are so born to do this. Now, that is them doing their healing and their creativity in their own way. Likewise, you know, some doctors are born to be doctors or, you know, some lawyers are born to be lawyers. And also, I think there is so much pressure externally on us from society, from what's expected of us, from parents, from our cultures that we grow up in, from religious backgrounds, from all of these different influences that make us question our internal self. It makes us question, oh, is this right? Oh, hang on. Do I know myself well enough? I spent most of my life hearing my intuition, feeling my intuition, knowing my intuition and ignoring it because I did not trust myself enough to act on it. And that's the biggest change is now I know myself so deeply. I trust my intuition and I take action on it. And that's where the magic's happening. Absolutely. And to be the individual who knows that, that is my intuition speaking, even mm. to get to that point, may be challenging for a lot of people. Yeah. Like, um, it's I come from this old school Indian culture where everybody had to become a doctor engineer to be even worthy of being introduced, like here's my daughter, and then fill in the blank. Yes, and yes. I, I've been around that. What I've seen is that, yes, to your point, you can be an accountant because maybe somehow either through external conditioning, you weren't um, forced to think that I had to stay within the lines. You naturally were gifted with numbers, Mm. but you were also intuitively creative. And so there was an alignment that allowed you to be that individual and be passionate and perform in that space. Mm. However, what I've seen, and perhaps you've seen is a lot of souls we walk past in our lives, especially in corporate world, Oh, yeah. They were staying within the lines. Oh, 100%. Absolutely. They are rare beasts, these ones that are actually doing their passion and purpose. And that's why I think they stand out in my memory. But you're right. Most people just do a job because they need to pay the bills. They do a job because that's what's expected of them. They do a job because that's the one I fell into. They, most of my jobs were jobs I fell into. And realistically, I never had the confidence in myself to apply for the jobs that actually would have set my heart on fire, that actually I would have been amazing at. I never had the confidence because I was always being told that I wasn't good enough, that I was too sensitive, that my skills weren't good enough, that I wasn't smart enough. You know, growing up, my sister was the smart, funny, pretty one. So what did I have left? And I can tell you now, children work in black and white. So I made myself, you know, the dumb, ugly, 
you know, whatever else one. And I lived to that for so many years because I was always, I mean, I was told by my first boyfriend, gosh, I wish you looked more like your sister. She's so attractive. You know, I, I welcomed in some awesome people, but you look at things like that. That was the messaging that I was getting all the time. Your sister's so amusing. She's so funny. She's so gorgeous. She's so this. And I'd be going, oh, okay. Like you, so why are you friends with me then? (laughs) And I would constantly question myself and that kind of conditioning that comes through puts dents in what you think you can achieve. It changes the trajectory of your life because you are all of a sudden taking yourself out of that, or for me, I took myself out of the competitive running. She was great in maths and science. I loved maths and science. I told myself I didn't, and I went down the humanities route and went with the English, the media studies, the less intellectual subjects, because then there was no comparison. And so I changed the trajectory of my life in those moments. In year nine, I remember correcting the maths teacher for his maths on the board. I was really good in that space and I checked out of it all because it was too competitive. And you think about how many people that happens to. Absolutely. And that the term that I've often used to express some of my life experiences where I felt um, not seen was where I was being placed in a box and a pit or what I called a pigeon box scenario and that could be personally because of culture mm-hmm. and you know like whatever it was that were being expected of me to stay within yeah. the lines or when I worked in corporate and the pigeon box would be oh this is what you do and in my mind I would get really frustrated like I do that really well but I do other things really well as well yeah Absolutely. It's like, um, I always sort of say, it's like I used to have one self for work and one self for my partner and one self for my children, one self for my parents and one self for my sister and one self for these friends and one self. It was exhausting. The difference with me now is there's one me. Now, different people will see different facets depending on who they are and how close in they are and all the rest of it. But it's still the one me. If clients meet me down the street, I'm still the same person. (laughs) Whereas previously, I would have been a different person. And how many times I've heard that from close girlfriends, Mm -hmm. uh, it it would frustrate me. They're like, well, you see this part of me. And I'm like, I want to see all of you and still that be the same individual that I could be having dinner with or working on a project with. Yeah. Right. Yeah, absolutely. It's exhausting to lose your it, energy that way. It absolutely is. Yeah. I, I've used the visual before for one of my clients. It's like we have all of these hats that are our different roles. And, but what you're doing is you're kind of forgetting to change hats sometimes. And you've got your mum hat on and your work hat on. And, the, you know, we end up not taking them on and off. And that's what we're living our life as is where we're in all of, because eventually it gets too exhausting to keep changing hats. And then you're just ending up putting hats on top of each other and you're getting unwell because of it. Yes. You're depleting yourself of energy mm. and you're not aligned at that yeah. point and un- unaware. So it goes back to the word consciousness. You are describing yeah. conscious and making conscious decisions in your life requires for you to be open to the idea that you're okay the way you are there's more to you than you you think you are Mm -hmm. and if more people were thinking like that imagine the world we'd be living in oh i often do and it's part of the reason that i do what i do i i talk about the that consciousness raising type stuff within the terms of internal and external scaffolding because I don't believe that we can do this path on our own I know for me I would not be where I am without the trust of professionals that I've worked with and I still work with them I've got my mentor I've got an acupuncturist and a hypnotherapist that I will work with at the moment and that's just to keep me level to keep me unstressed to keep me you know aligned to help me see the things that I can't see It's not me giving my power away. 
It is not me trusting those external influences over my internal truth. It is having them help keep me aligned, help me see the things in my subconscious mind that of course I can't see because it's my subconscious mind. (laughs) They help me gain different perspectives and different viewpoints. And then there's the internal scaffolding, which is what you say, it is keeping the physical body healthy. It's my walks on the beach. It's my meditation. It's my journaling. It's my writing. It's my, all of those things that I do, my healthy eating, my water fasting, my yoga, my Pilates, my saunas, all of those things that keep my body aligned. And when I'm not doing them regularly, I feel it. I feel my mental health slipping. I feel my spiritual health slipping. I feel my connection slipping. And so it really is for me important to have both of those two aspects set beautifully. And the thing with professionals that I speak about a lot is we spend a lot more time researching our next car than we do working out which professionals are a fit for us when we're working with our mental, emotional and spiritual health. We need to shop it around. We need somebody who is a, oh my God, hell yes, I feel safe with this person. I feel held by this person. And they aren't trying to fix me to their idea of who I should be. They are the professionals you should be working with. That's exactly what I believe is so beautiful about tying it back to the passion part Mm. that you understand that they're seeing you and they're they're using their lens or their gift to guide you but they're not trying to shape you into something different Mm. it's almost like channeling the energy like i sometimes like to work with breath work because i get anxious you know a friend of mine is good at that She's not trying to change me into a different human, but Mm. that gift is there so that you can recalibrate Mm. your energy. Absolutely. Absolutely. And I think I've seen a lot, actually, I've stopped following a lot of coaches, a lot of (laughs) healers in the last number of years, because I've started to see the energetic hooks they put into clients. And that a lot of clients aren't looking like they're getting better. And that for me is that real idea because there's been fear and scarcity around. There's been that mentality that seems to have grown of I better keep my clients close because, the, you know, there's financial concerns and all of this. And I'm going, no, that's not the case. But I've seen it in practice and it comes across or I see it clearly because that's the energy I work in. And I've had to stop following because I'm going, this isn't healthy for any of you. When you are just holding space for the client to make their own awarenesses. And yes, of course, we we are using techniques. We are finding, you know, in kinesiology, we find the emotion that's sitting there. What does this emotion mean to you? Even when people say, oh, can you explain the emotion? I'll often Google it or I'll explain this is my interpretation of the emotion. What do you think it means for you? It's directing those questions back because when the client can say the first thing that pops into their mind in that healing session, that is usually a subconscious talking to them. When they give it that moment and they speak over it and they think over it and they're giving it conscious thought, that's when they're going into that logical mind, which is not the subconscious at all. And so the the most challenging thing I often say I've had to learn to do in this last seven years when I've been working in this is learning to speak before I think, whereas growing up, I was always told to think before I speak. Yeah, that is that is wonderful. It's, and it's, it's a straddle between both worlds, because as, when I've worked in corporate, often it's think before you say it. But mm. my my more intuitive spiritual side doesn't want to cooperate. Yeah, of course, because your intuitive spiritual side is the the you, the true you. It's not the ego. It's not the. I mean, it, it's obviously guided by the ego because we need our ego in our three D reality. But it's not that people pleaser. It's not those parts of you that are trying to protect that inner self from harm from hurt from 
rejection. It's not all of those parts of you. It is that true God source energy coming through you. Now you mentioned something, and maybe just to wrap up the passion purpose, that when you work with people, you tie it back to the understanding that there's a f- emotion, the feeling. Mm-hmm. And then I've heard o- over and over that if things that when you f- start feeling it, it means it's already in your physiology, it's in your mm-hmm. being. However, it first starts with a thought or an energy an energy and then it could turn into something manifested as emotions then physical feeling how do you help someone who may not have that more subtle understanding that i need to control my not control but i need to have awareness of how my thoughts will then manifest into my body well, uh... I probably have some different ideas than other people in that, you know, yes, it is that whole change your thoughts, change your life type type thing. But what people then do is they get hyper fixated on the fact that I can't think negative thoughts. I can't think negative thoughts and people misunderstand the law of attraction and oh, I can't think any negative thoughts or I'm just going to be attracting negative stuff. And yes and no. I mean, if you're, if that's all you are fixated on, but we are human beings. We are going to have negative thoughts. I am going to get up, you know, at 5 a.m. to do a podcast and go, oh, my skin's looking a little pale. Of course I am <laughs> because I'm human. Now, does it matter? No, I've put out plenty of videos at 5 a.m. I often do, you know, video calls with people. Does it matter? Of course it doesn't. You know, so what? I look a little bit pale. Nobody else is judging me for it, just myself. But if I get hyper fixated on that, oh my God, I've constantly got to put on makeup or I've constantly got to do this or I've constantly got to do that. It creates this big whirlwind. Likewise, if I go, oh, I've had another cancellation this week because, you know, people are often sick, especially at the moment and the last few years, people are resting when they're sick, which is amazing, by the way. I think there are some absolute gold from this last few years but it means that people shift their appointments more regularly than they used to and everybody in a service-based business especially in Australia at the moment that I speak to is finding this so all of a sudden you go oh that puts it pretty tight for me to I don't know pay my bills or whatever it is if that thought continues to churn and churn and churn then I end up in anxiety fear all of those things If I am able to catch that thought and recognize that so far in my seven year journey, I haven't missed a rent payment yet. (laughs) I haven't, you know, I'm still not on the street. So things are okay. I guess going back to the Lord's prayer, give us today our daily bread. I've got enough for today. I'm absolutely fine. It depends on which way my thoughts go, but it doesn't mean I'm not going to have the negative thought. You know, some mornings I'm walking the beach. I always love walking the beach, but some mornings it is hammering down with rain. It's all squidgy sand. There's no, you know, harder sand to walk on. And it feels like a real battle. My body gets tired. It's really challenging. And in those mornings, it is really easy to fall into my old mindset of, oh, it's just a horrible walk this morning. This weather's terrible. You know, it's such hard work. My legs are sore. Do I really need to go all that way? Maybe I just cut my walk short. It's really easy to fall into that. And then what the practice has done, what the work I've done has done is gone. You are still on the beach. There are some people who never see a beach in their lifetime. I am walking because I have the ability to walk. (laughs) I have a big warm coat, which allows me to stay mostly dry. My dog absolutely loves it. He couldn't care less what the weather is. And I know at my halfway point, I get to see my community at this little cafe, get a really nice chai and head back along the beach. They're two very different mindsets. It doesn't mean you're never going to have negative thoughts. It does. We have a we have a propensity as human beings for negativity, because that's what keeps us safe. 
it's us looking for danger. It keeps us alive to the next day, which is a really important part of our physiology. What we need to be able to do is check that negative or positive thinking. Yes, and then channel that into understanding that whatever lights you up, yeah, can, you can still, it's almost as though you're aware, like th- this is how I treat the mm. concept of passion purpose when it comes to negativity, is that when it happens, which it does, let's say yeah. something where it's like lower back pain for me often is the case, I will recognize and going, well, it's, it's going to give me an opportunity to get some more walks in. <laughs> Yeah, I need more steps. And by virtue of doing so, you've moved the energy around. Yeah, yeah. So there's absolutely a positive spin on everything you can. I mean, again, I'm trying to be practical, but because yeah. I realize as humans, we have to have some level of, I would say, the ability to recognize um, a situation, and maybe that triggers the negativity. Mm. And also, terrifying, right? When we, if you think about, let's use the yin yang sign, there is light in the dark, there is dark in the light, and we need the dark and the light to be together. And if we don't have the dark and the light, we can't understand either of them. So we need those dark times, we need the grief so we can understand the joy, we need the anger so we can understand the happy, we need the, we need the extremes of emotion so that we can feel all of it. The problem is we try and numb the, the negative bad emotions that we think we're having and only focus on the good, but that's called delusion and denial. We're not being awake. The idea of being on the spiritual path for me is about living in harmony. It is accepting that I will go into depressions. It is accepting that I will also be in grief at times. But it's also accepting that the more I can allow myself to go into those deep, dark emotions, also the higher I end up getting into the positive emotions, the wonder and the awe and the breathtaking beauty that I feel in the world, I couldn't experience that at the high levels I do if I hadn't allowed myself to feel the lows that I do. Absolutely. And knowing that you could have perspective, having Mm. that. Yes, I I agree, because I go through the same thing. And often I come out of it going, well, I recognize that I was reliving the moments of grief of, Mm. in my case, losing someone. And then Mm. recognizing that and saying, okay, but now I have the joy of holding my son and seeing other beautiful things in life. Yeah, absolutely. Absolutely. And I think when we deny those negative emotions is when they have the hold over us. When we allow ourselves to feel them and to be in them, they, they move through because there's nothing to fight against. So we're not somatizing them. We're not solidifying them in our body. That's where the problem comes in. Because when we fight against the emotion, that's when it gets stuck. When we recognize we're in the emotion, and yes, we might use one of our external people to help us get out of it, or we might go and use some of our internal tools to shift it through faster, Mm -hmm. but we're not denying its existence. We're not trying to live only in love and light. We also need to accept that there will be shadows and darkness. Yes. And this is where I sort of go a bit against that love, whole love and light community. I think it is living in denial and it's only allowing half of our experience to be valid. Yeah. And you absolutely answered the question. I may not have articulated in the beginning, but when I was mm. talking about um, the negative negativity or emotion mm. and being locked, it's, I am around a lot of people like yourself who understands it's going to work its way through you're accepting it you're witnessing it or being aware of it and so then you're not locking it into your physiology Mm -hmm. and having it just like a thyroid condition like I have you know or had but it it can start affecting other areas and if you learn to recognize it at an early age it's such a gift 
Absolutely. And yeah. I love seeing the younger people coming through my clinic, you know, the, the people who are in their late teens and early twenties. Cause I'm like, thank God you're finding the work now. This is amazing because it is, it's just imagine, you know, if I'd actually listened to those calls that I had in my late teens, early twenties, my whole life would have been different. Now, I know why it wasn't, of course, and I'm grateful for that. I have two incredible children whom I just love watching at the moment because they are blossoming into these incredible humans. And also, I know that my life would have been completely different if I had accepted the callings that I had earlier in life. So when I see people coming through my clinic who are switched on and becoming aware at their early age, I am cheering because that shows evolution is working. <laughs> well, this is my favorite part of our conversation today because I, I believe it's working. My business was named after my son, Omni, and mm-hmm. I had a, a, from, he was just a baby. I would mm-hmm. just want him to recognize the value of meditation so for the longest time it was him just watching me but now recently i have him to just one minute yeah and what i have him do is nothing else but i just say what does it feel Mm. and that's that is what even most adults can't articulate yeah and you know me i I feel peace and that's Mm. coming from a 10 year old yeah how amazing yeah but Oh, there's just so much wealth of knowledge you've you've pulled into this conversation. Tying it back, though, to our purpose, channeling mm. it into the purpose. So you've got the passion. You recognize that there's an awareness that we have of all the fire in us. And yeah. it guides us. And when we are not trained, like you over the mm. course of your life, you become trained in listening to it and becoming more um of the person you were wanting to be now how how does someone who's listening to this maybe a younger woman take this knowledge of that passion and very practical approach and then turning it into a purpose in her life or his life well i think that it's such a nuanced question because obviously it will be very different for for it you know, every, every person and, and we can all take our passions and purpose and do completely different things with them. I think what it is first for me is it's slowing down and breathing and becoming really present in your body and starting to make friends with the signs and signals that you're getting from your body. And that is our thoughts and emotions. That is those niggly pains or those feelings okay, I wonder why that's there today. Oh, you know, have I rested enough? Have I slept well enough? Those little things lead to the bigger things. Those little awarenesses lead to us going, what does light me up? What does excite me? You know, I've started making soaps and things like that, that I'm going to sell at some of the market stalls that I'm going to do later in the year, just because I was like, oh, I'd like to do that. So all of a sudden I'm doing it. It's bizarre and I never thought I'd be doing it, but you know, such is, that's what I've, that's what's come through. So that's my latest creative pursuit. Now, is that going to, I don't know, make me money? I don't know. It's just something fun that I'm doing for now because why not? And I think it's having the courage just to follow a few different things. What we have this this societal expectation of is that you leave high school and you choose a job for the rest of your life that you go to university you get the training and how many people stay in the training because they went to university and they're like otherwise i've wasted my university degree it's it's crazy really but what we what it is it's really about starting to look at what lights you up what do you have fun doing the first thing that goes when we're stressed is all of the stuff that lights us up. So if you've been stressed for a long time, I mean, I remember after, well, as I was going through that whole divorce process, both the separation and divorce, I had no clue what I enjoyed anymore. I didn't know. I had to think back, okay, what were some of the things that I used to enjoy? Well, I used to enjoy dancing. I used to enjoy this. I used to enjoy that. Okay, so there's some starting points. 
And that's kind of where I had to start with it. It's playing with it. It's giving yourself permission to try a lot of different things and know that you're going to get some of them wrong. It's knowing that you don't have to be making your millions from doing your passion and purpose. Yes, you can, obviously, because there's a lot of people out there doing that, but you don't have to. Your passion and purpose might just be you knitting at the end of a day. Just it's about trying things. It's about having fun. It's about remembering that this life is short and precious. And do we really want to spend it miserable? Or do we want to have a bit of fun along the way? And with the archetypal work I do, we do look at in the first eight archetypes, four of them are your genius flow and four are your problem pattern. Within your genius flow, you have your three passion and purpose archetypes and one talent archetype. Now, in finding that flow, it does give you a lot of answers in terms of what does light you up. So for me, mine is about nurturing myself so that I can nurture others. It is about connecting to the subconscious mind, connecting to that infinite wisdom aspect. It is then learning what I need to learn in this 3D world and teaching that to people and taking it out into the world. And everything I do, whether it be with my children, whether it be with clients, whether everything I do well follows that, um, what do you want to call it, formula. Every problem I have starts with me either in overwhelm or with way too lofty goals. Every single problem. And then I lose my inspiration. I lose my focus. I get angry. I turn that anger in on myself. (laughs) And that's how I run every single problem in my life. Now, knowing that gives me ideas when I'm moving through the world as to whether I'm in my genius or whether I'm in my problem. And then I know how to interrupt those patterns so that I can choose differently. And live more consciously. Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. And you can more consciously be aware that you are living your in the present moment, Mm. a a moment of passion and Mm. turn it into purpose. But that's the thing. I I agree with you. Passion and purpose is not just a one singular thing that you've got the stamp from the university, you go off and you're practicing. You you can be practicing multiple. I I love to cook. Yeah. Yeah. And I get joy from that. But mm-hmm. like we're saying, you can have a passion purpose also where it, it's a means to an end. It pays the bills, but it could, you could be lucky. My husband's married or my husband has a friend who um, the guy is an accountant by day, mm-hmm. but built an incredible um, set of rooms in his homes. that are tropical in nature. So you walk in and you're transported. Wow. And so He's using both sides of yeah. the both logical and creative. Yeah, absolutely. Absolutely. And I think that's it. It's finding those things that really light you up and remembering that as adults, we need hobbies too. We need things that light us up. We need things that are playtime. It's not just children that need playtime. We need it as well. So it really is embracing that aspect of ourselves as well, because that's what's going to light us up and make, if we do have to have that nine to five, job to pay the bills it makes that more enjoyable if we're doing our passion in other areas of our life because we've got to be practical as well and as much as the the message out there is you know go live your passion live your purpose you know jump off that cliff we still have practical stuff to do we have bills to pay we have food that we need to put on the table we have roofs to put over our head we have you know cars to run we have all of those things that we need to do so we do need to bring in real world practicality with it as well. Absolutely. And I love the fact that you've um, sort of wrapped it up with it being very practical because mm. that is at the end of the day, I want other women to feel empowered knowing it's not just about the fluffy, esoteric, mindfulness stuff yeah. that we'll talk about. One of the things that I am a massive proponent of is grounded spirituality. We need to be connected to this earth. All of this 4D, 5D, 7D consciousness, all of the stuff that people are talking about, it's amazing. But you know what? You can only properly access it if you are fully grounded in this 3D reality that we have chosen to be born into. 
if we are going and getting that wisdom and bringing it back here and living it, that is the purpose of it. But we can all access those higher mindsets. We can sit on our mat and on till the cows come home and feel amazing. But we're also denying the reality of this world that we've been born into. Now, if we're bringing all of that passionate stuff back, all of those beautiful messages of love and connection back with us and living them within our community, that's when we start being a change maker. Otherwise, we're just off with the fairies. So I really believe that we have to bring all of that work back down into this grounded reality and use it in a practical way to make our world better. Absolutely. I, I couldn't agree with you more. I could write it. That's just brilliant what you just said. Thank you so much. I am oh, my absolute pleasure. Thank you for having me. <laughs> yeah, yeah, I really enjoyed it. And I love the fact that the way you wrapped it up. I hope you can come back because I would love to have a deeper conversation on any facet of what we've discussed today. Yeah, yeah. Oh, I'm always happy to do deep dives. So I'd be honored to. <laughs> yeah, the archetype conversation would be a fun one. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. Yes. Wonderful. Awesome. awesome. Thank you so much. Well, I appreciate you deeply. I hope you have a wonderful day. Thank you for waking up so early for our 5 a.m. <laughs> <laughs> My absolute pleasure. Honestly, I loved it. Thank you. Thanks for tuning in, sweet soul. If you've enjoyed this episode, I would be so grateful for your kind review on Apple Podcast. Simply click on the link in the show notes to leave your lovely feedback and uplift our spirits. Your support means the world to me and helps our show thrive. So please show me your love and continue to practice Omni Mindfulness.